Did you know you can support Hugo's Desk in Patreon? Starting as low as $1 per month, your subscription to the channel will give you access to a lot of perks. For example, you can vote in my next video or help me select the next topics of the channel. You'll have access to our growing Hugo's Desk community with a private Discord channel and a private Facebook group. You can even take part of our monthly Q&As and AMAs. By subscribing to my channel and Patreon, you're not only helping me keeping the channel alive, but you can help make Hugo's Desk better, bigger, and with even more content. And now, on to the video. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, we really don't need that. Um, okay, so thank you so much for coming uh, today. Oh, this is loud. Okay. Uh, I, sp I talk really loud because I'm Portuguese, so you might be want to be careful with the volume there. Uh, so thank you so much for coming today. Uh, today, this is a session, very special session. It's called You Just Have to Be Better at Making Game Cinematics. And I have a special guest, Martin, Martin Mayer. He is here mm. as my special guest. He's going to also help us going through this uh, phase of getting better. But first, as you guys are probably used to, I'm going to shamelessly promote myself by, first of all, introducing myself. My name is Hugo Guerre. I'm Portuguese. And that's Martin Mayer. Uh, he can talk a little bit when he gets the mic. Um, I myself have been working for quite a while in the industry for about 20 years. I have started on the BBC, I've worked at Nexus for a bit, worked for a long time at the mill uh, as the head of new compositing. Some of the techniques you're going to see here today came from that department. When I built the new department over there, uh, together with my co-head uh, of uh, department, you, uh, Juan Brockhaus. Fire.Smoke is an agency I worked for as a director. Most of the work you're going to see here today was directed for Fire.Smoke. Hugo's Desk is my YouTube channel and my own company as well. You guys should check out my website, hugoeifenguerre.com, to see some of my work. And I have worked with, lately I've just been working with Game Cinematics. These are some of the uh, clients that I've been having with Game Cinematics, and these are the games that I've been working. Uh, I've also had a double life as a teacher, so I've been teaching uh, at Scape Studios. I've, uh, I've been doing things with the Foundry, with a bunch of schools. You can read them all here. I don't need to to uh, talk about them. I also talk in a lot of festivals, as you can see, the, including here at FMX. And you guys should definitely follow my YouTube channel called Hugo's Desk, where this recording will end up next week as well. And also the recording of the, uh, of the talk I had uh, the week before. But first, let's have a 360 photo, because it's a tradition, so we have to do one. But now, let's keep in mind that uh, this one was the one from last year. As you can see, it was a bit lame, like people didn't really react to it. I want you guys to prove to me that we can do this and we can be really kind of loud and move around. I'm going to go into the middle here. Let's just get this going. Can we have the lights on, please? Lights on? Okay, so you guys want to give all you got? Come on, move your arms, scream, do whatever you want. Uh, you hold on, let's just one for safety. Okay, perfect. So come back next year to see the photo from this year. <laughs> Eventually you'll see it. Thank you so much. So now back to the show. So first off, even before I open some Nook scripts, I will introduce Martin Mayer, and we will take the floor to show you some cool stuff. Take it away. All right. Don't forget to record. Check, check. Ah, very good. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, recording is screen. The first things first, yeah. <laughs> so, but while this is opening, my name is Martin Mayer. I'm the head of creative specialist at the Foundry. And I had the pleasure to work with this guy on uh, the show, stuff that we'll be showing you. So I'll just uh, start the recording. And uh, what I would like to show you, even though this is mostly about compositing, is a little bit of UVing inside of Modo. Now, this is not the most exciting thing around, but we decided to invest into UVs to really allow the pipeline that Hugo built um, to be just a little bit better at the game cinematics, eventually. <laughs> we always so, want to be better. Um, That's the idea. What you see in front of you, this lovely sea of grey, is a uh, Modo 12. and. Um, we picked Modo for modeling because I think the tool set inside of it for modeling in particular is really excellent. It allows you to fly through even the complex shapes quite effectively. And the UVing is often an overlooked area that uh, Modo has actually really stellar tools for. So this guy that was hidden around the corner is Alvin. This is a uh, one of the models in the game. And um, 
this is the base shape. This is just what came from retopology, from ZBrush. All the high-res detail was sculpted in ZBrush. And this is how I got it, and we needed to create a UV layout for this. Um, we decided to work with the UDIM layout, so it works well with Mari. And we can really scale up the resolution of the textures quite far. So um, let's just do a little bit of live UVing because I think it's really cool. Just before that, though, do we have people in the room who work with 3D applications or just compositors? Yay, awesome. Uh, how many people work in Modo? Uh, that could be better. It's to be <laughs> Okay, so um, I'll just pick something here. And uh, first of all, in Modo, you can have multiple UV maps. So this particle thing has only one UV channel, and I'll create a new one. Um, just call it texture. And uh, let's slice it up. So for UVing, you need to create some sort of seams. Um, the selection tool sets inside of Modo was the first thing that helped us to get it really done quickly. So just by double clicking, you can select, select edge loops. This is something that you might be familiar with in other 3D apps, but it gets better, so I'll just go around here very quickly, double clicking and double clicking. Where it becomes program problematic is where the edge loops don't follow any sensible order. So that's when some of the really cool stuff that Modo has under the hood, like for example, uh, selection traveling uh, allows you to just quickly go with the upper row and I can just let it go like that, maybe not this far, so a down arrow and go around like this. So now I have a seam that I can actually use here. And I'll just go to unwrap, select the unwrap, and right here it created a nice layout for the hand to be used. Couple issues with it still though. If I look at the distortion, you see that the, um, the pinching or where the texture would be distorted, that wouldn't look all that hot. So you can fix it. Um, for example, one of the really cool tools inside of Modo is the Relax tool. And that can be used in many interesting things. Right now, I'm using it as an adaptive tool. But uh, I can use also angle-based. Oh, sorry, I want to turn this off. Let's set it to smooth. And then let's go to adaptive. That will go through every single polygon. I actually look at, will look at the way this needs to be aligned. And that did this really cool, nearly distortion-free um, result. So since the tools inside of Modo are unified, right, you can use the tools um, across the whole, whole uh, application. Um, I can do things like, you know, just hide a little bit um, and I don't have to go and select any UVs. I can uh, grab some polygons and vertices just like this and shift up, shift S to smooth them out. Or I can even use something like the sculpting tools, which is just the regular sculpting tools and smooth some of these UVs out this way. Um, but one of my favorite things, and especially with hands, is the, the uh, unwrap tool has a really nice hidden uh, functionality. Well, it's not that hidden, it's just um, not that obvious. If I set this to zero and enable the, um, oops, I go to like, let's say angle base, then enable the interactive, then I can set some constraints. So I would like to constrain this, 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 and this. And then I can give it some iterations. So let's say 300. And uh, what I effectively did, I rigged up the UVs so I can really nicely tweak them and place them exactly where I need them to be. And I can unwrap the texture uh, much more effectively. Uh, so one more thing that I would like to show you is a, uh, let's say how we can unwrap the head. And um, I can just go ahead and go to my edges. And from selection sets, I already prepared the seams. So this is where um, the pelting should happen, actually around the corner. And let's just hit unwrap again, angle based, let's say 1,000 iterations, and run through it once. So that will give me some sort of unwrapped uh, feature. I can fix the, I can fix the, uh, um, uh, the, the not symmetrical issues, but um, See how this is not really utilizing most of the texture space? Uh, for that, we can, for example, use the packing feature. And um, let's just pack this to the first duden, which is this first square here. Let's hit auto and let Modo cook this. And this will try to find the best alignment uh, for the images, so or for the UV shells. So when you look at the whole model and every single piece in it, and I look at the proper UV channel, uh, which would be, I believe, this guy. This is all the UVs and all the textures that we were using on this particular character. So 
Um, model can really help you out when it comes to UVing and um, also texturing. Well, now we can actually have a look what kind of magic who got it with this stuff. Oh. Is it for me? Oh, is it for me? Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Um, can we? Yeah, thank you. So uh, basically, the reason we want to show you this is because if we open those shots today, you'll see that the UV setup inside of Nuke was fundamental to do this cinematic for Heroes Arena. And so that's why we wanted to show that. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to uh, uh, make it a bit different this year. So I'm going to make you guys vote which shots we're going to open. So basically, we're gonna, we, I brought six shots from, a produc from productions, and I'm going to give you a choice. OK, so basically, just want you guys to think about this. I brought six <laughs> shots in productions. I'll start with these two. So do you guys want to see a full CG shot from Heroes Arena, or do you want to see a stylized CG shot from The Walking Dead March to War? Hands up for Heroes Arena. OK. <laughs> Hands up for Walking Dead. Oh man, I'm gonna, gonna <laughs> have to count? Come on. Do it again, like Heroes Arena. Okay? Walking Dead. Heroes Arena, okay. She says, she's the boss, so we'll do that. Okay, so please keep in mind that the other one that I'm not gonna open, you can see it on Hugo's desk if you subscribe to my channel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, open up that shot. So as I remember, um, we are... So first off, even before I show the shot, I'm going to show you that we don't open shots, at least on our pipeline, we don't open shots directly in Nuke. We have a script that runs Nuke, which allows us to actually run our own plugins, our own pipeline, on our own uh, uh, naming convention for the whole thing. Uh, so this is what this script is. This is a command line that basically opens Nuke already. The reason we did this is because, as you guys know, I work remotely with my artists. So for example, Bjorn here was one of my compositors. He works in Iceland. And his computer, of course, has a specific path for the hard drive. My computer, on the other hand, has another specific path to the hard drive. This entire system and pipeline automatically changes the paths to all the files on the comps, depending if it's Bjorn, or if it's me, or if it's Martin. And this works for Maya and also for Nuke. So let's open up the shot to actually guide you through it. So this is done through this menu, which is called the OP Hub. The OP Hub allows us to have multiple plugins, and we even have a pipeline tool to create published access. We can even uh, cross copy between projects. We can even import and export uh, caches. Uh, actually, even if someone in Maya is working on a CG animation, automatically I'll get the uh, Alembic cache of that animation, and automatically I'll get the camera as well. It's all automated. But let's open the shot. Uh, the shot that we are going to open is going to be uh, the one that you guys voted. Um, is going to be shot 200. So this is uh, the menu that I have for all the shots. I brought a bunch of shots, but of course you guys voted, so it's too late now. So I brought uh, shot 200. As you can see, this is a comp shot. We also had uh, multiple versions. We had 15 versions until the end. And as you can see, all my versions have a few notes. Uh, so if I open up this shot, I'm just going to go through the shot and kind of disconstruct it a little bit and kind of show you uh, what we were up to. So the final shot, this is the script, it's not very complicated, um, and the final shot uh, looks like this. It's a very short shot, it's a full CG, it's my favorite shot of the trailer, it's a really badass trailer, you should check the trailer uh, if you go to my Hugo's Desk channel. This was, I know it's a bit dark over there, but if you check it on YouTube it will look better. This was completely rendered in Redshift uh, in GPU, uh, we baked in the motion blur into it and we rendered all the UVs. And then practical, uh, like basically all the particle systems and all the fires, they are all done in Houdini. So I'm going to just break down this thing and show you what I mean. So on the very top here, we basically started by having our background. So as you can see here, this is our main background, which is with baked motion blur and rendered in redshift. So this is a barn that we had a destruction system using uh, Houdini to actually destroy the barn doors and destroy all the wood. And of course, as you can see, it's all lit up by the actual uh, monster that is going through uh, the image. This was rendered as an EXR and we also outputted all the shaders that would help us to composite. So as you can see here, I have the 
the GI, I have the reflections, I have the uh, background reflections, I have the specklers and so on. I have all the UVs that I need for all these things, including the raw lighting as well, if I need to access to it as well. And I also have a, a bunch of utility shots, you know. Utility shots serve you to use for depth of field, for motion blur, to retexture certain things. Uh, and we had everything. I am a big, uh, I'm a big fan of outputting every single AUV and then kind of hope for the best and kind of work with it. So that's what we did on this entire project. By the time we get into here, what you see on my comp here is we are basically, because we're working on the cloud, we're working remotely, we don't really render EXRs all merged with all the passes inside the EXR because that's too much bandwidth. That would be, you know, like a 300 meg per frame EXR. So we split it on one EXR per pass so that it's much easier to play back and it's also much easier to actually upload and download in, in, in Google Drive or in Dropbox. By the time we get into the end of the comp here, we basically rebuild the whole shader and we have access to all the passes inside the layering system of Nuke. And by then, I start rebuilding my shader. As usual, Redshift is a GI-based shader, so that means it's pretty much a plus operation if you're not using raw passes. So we are basically going to use the raw GI, which will be plus uh, multiplied by the diffuse texture. So as you can see here, this is just the texture with only color, and this is just the GI. And then we basically rebuild. Now I'm gonna move on to the monster itself because it looks a bit cooler. Uh, so after all the rebuild is happening here, you can kind of see that that's the result I had. I had a couple of color correction uh, nodes here using some object IDs. I had some color correctors per pass. I'm a big fan of comping a bit like a 3D artist would comp, you know? If they are affecting the lighting, I would go to the light pass to affect the lighting. And if I want to uh, uh, interfere with the speculars or the reflections, I would go to those passes to interfere with it. And because this is all a dialogue with the CG team, and so that they don't feel also that we are basically doing double work. Everyone is working together to try to achieve the coolest shot possible. Let's go back into Godal here. So basically this is the baked render coming from Redshift in Motion Blur. As you can see here, E looks pretty. And we have all these passes, like I told you, that become one single EXR with all the uh, things. And then in here, I have a little few things that I wanted to show you. So not only we've rebuilt all the diffuse and we basically picked up the, f the raw diffuse, we picked up the, um, um, the, raw dif the, the raw diffuse, multiplied it by the lighting. We also had the subsurface scattering, which in this shot specifically, you don't see it uh, because it's from the angle. Uh, but we have also the eyes, we also have the reflections, and we also have the specular lights, and also the emission. And on all these things, I kind of did, you know, some tweaks, some glows, but what I really wanted to show you is the UV setup here, which is something that links up to what Martin was showing. So this is what we ended up doing to try to have some scratches for uh, Godal. And you're probably wondering, why the hell would I do this and not do this in 3D? Well, the reason we didn't do this in 3D was because we've rendered everything already. It was already very late in the project. We only had a few weeks to deliver, and we just felt that in Nuke it would be faster to render this entire thing through Nuke. So this is literally just a pass of a bunch of scratches. And the way that this is done is using the actual UV. So as you can see here, we bring in the UVs and then we actually bring them in like this. We use a UV tile system to merge the mat. And that's kind of really cool because then what happens is we can actually put certain textures on specific parts of the character. I didn't do this on this specific one because in here we basically just used uh, like I said, I was in a rush, so I basically got this, this layer from a stock, uh, a stock website. Uh, oh, sorry, Nuke does this all the time. Come on, come over here. Uh, so I basically did a bit of tiling to make a bit more scratches, inverted it, did a bit of color correction, merged it against the format so that I have a bit of noise pattern on it as well. And then if I go here to the CG, this is what I was talking to you about my pipeline. I always have the full geometry always loaded up inside Nuke. This is really helpful for my compositors and for me as well to load up elements and everything. And this is all automated. So this Alembic animation, as soon as a new CG artist animates something new, if he publishes the scene on my pipeline, it will suddenly 
come alive on my script. It will pop up a, a warning saying, you have a new version of this uh, render. Do you want to import it? And this will allow you to do multiple things. You can attach elements to the actual geometry of the sword, for example. You can put some scratches on the geometry of, of, of the whole thing. And in this case, what I did was I used the multiple texture system to actually render out uh, just a bunch of textures and scratches on top. If you just give it a second, it will show up. And that's the render. And the other thing, it's really slow because I'm using actually uh, sampling inside of the scanline render, so we actually motion blur the CG. Now, keep in mind that these days, this was done about a year and a half ago, this trailer. These days, I would not use the scanline render. I would have used the ray tracer because it would produce a much higher quality motion blur and it would produce a much higher quality anti-aliasation as well. So keep that in mind. So when that's done, I render it out, and what I do with this thing is I use it as a texture blended in with all the passes. So for example, in here, I have the diffuse, and what I need to do for this to work is to basically multiply my scratches through the diffuse, and the same goes to multiplying the scratches that I have through the actual lighting pass. That is the only way for you to actually have all the scratches to actually uh, uh, use the lighting, because if one, when, when it comes from the Nuke script, of course, you don't see the lighting direction. And that, of course, gives you something like this. If I look at it really closely, it gives you these kind of little really nice details. If, you, if I switch this off, you can kind of see some scratches all over the place, the armor. We can kind of see some bumpiness happening on the armor here. We can kind of see some things here. And it's all lit up and completely integrated because it's multiplied by its light. That's why it's done that way. Uh, that's how we did that shot. And as of course, like I usually do, I then ended up uh, plussing all the passes together to get the best result possible of, out of my AOVs by doing certain special, uh, you know, basically doing certain little small color corrections here, uh, some glows there, and of course some global color corrections to the whole thing, just to making it a bit more punchy. And then after that, we also did the depth of field. The depth of field was used with a real bouquet texture, and I used a plugin called the PG Bouquet. The PG Bouquet is one of my favorite plugins for depth of field. Depth of field, usually I use, I've done that on the talk last year as well. I like the way the PG Bouquet works because it gives you the most photoreal type of depth of field. First of all, because you can get really these really nice bouquets happening, but it also can mimic a real camera because if you open this up, you can kind of see that it actually has a lens and an aperture. In this situation on Maya, I had a 16 millimeter lens, which is what I have here. And in Maya, I had, you know, on the depth of field, I kind of, from an artistic point of view, I put an f-stop of 1.2, which gave me a really nice uh, defocused happening. Of course, it's a bit exaggerated, but the whole trailer is highly stylized, so don't, don't, uh, don't take it against me. Then we have some special glows here where we basically pull up the, re the speculars and the reflections of the scene, I glow them a little bit, and then I merge them on top. And that basically gives me this kind of effect. It gives me this kind of glint of light hitting the metal when you get, it's almost like when you get this kind of sun speck across a car or across the chrome of a car. It's kind of that kind of situation where we basically pick up the reflection pass, glow it and merge it as a screen. Doing a screen operation because I don't want to plus it up. I don't want it to overexpose. I did the same as well with the specular pass, glow it and then merge it on top. And I do that three times actually to have different levels of glow. Ones which are bigger, uh, uh, wider glows and other ones that are just pings of glow. Basically then, of course, the background comes along. The background has already been pre-comped with the depth of field. So if I go all the way up here, there's the PG bouquet. The two PG, PG bouquets, by the way, they are linked by an expression. So that means that they are running the same f-stop and the same lens and the same defocusing. So if I decide to animate one, the other one works as well. Then other things that I have here is, these are the, we got from, uh, from Udini. This was the raw fire that we got. Back then, the client wanted in fire, but then we changed it to green. Uh, so as usually, last, last minute changes, really. Um, and so we did that. We call the credit to green because it's more magical that way. You know, that was the feedback that we got. It needs to look more magical. And so we made it more magical by using that pass and, of course, doing a bunch of glows to it as well to make it a bit more uh, uh, diffused and scattered. And then, basically, we also had a bunch of uh, particles coming out of his head as well because his helmet was supposed to be on fire. But, of course, that also changed 
to green because again green is more magical and so then we got a bit of glow into it we got another bit of glow to it because glow is always it always works and that's the um, result here if you just give it a second a few seconds maybe a few more seconds <laughs> the PG bouquet goes without saying it's an incredibly heavy uh, node because it's processing depth of field with bouquet and with uh, f-stop so it's it's really really heavy but as you can see here it worked really nicely and actually the fire kind of turned out well we also had some particles coming through the swords as well which was done by our amazing team of particle uh, artists in Udini and then uh, by the end we also had a couple of particles coming out of uh, the swords we also had some particles coming out of the actual helmet that all comp get comped in I had a flare of course because why not a flare is always nice on a shot uh, if you're not putting a flare you're not worth the money of compositing and then we have a bunch of final color correctors, vignettes, and I'm rushing this because I need to move on to the next shot. And then I have like some sharpened notes, some cheeky sharpened notes. I'm just gonna stop the comp here so I can actually show you. Um, so basically when, basically when we get here, because I was directing this project myself, I had the luxury of uh, you know, actually putting the color corrections and the final tweaks to it myself, which is an advantage when you are controlling the creative of a project. Uh, and I'm just talking and talking, waiting for this to show up. That's why I'm talking so much. Uh, we basically then have a color correction, another color correction, a bit of vignetting to try to focus our attention on the bad dude here, a bit of color correction again to try to focus attention on him, a bit of cheeky sharpen. I'm using a lock to in conversion so the sharpen doesn't break my black points. A bit of color correction, a bit of chromatic aberration because why not? Some distortion of an 18 millimeter. I didn't have a 16 millimeter lens distortion node, so I kind of used an 18. It's almost the same anyway. It's a CG shot, so it doesn't really need to be physically accurate. And then I have some noise. So this is basically a plate of, of grain. It's an actual plate of grain shot uh, with a camera. That gave you kind of a nice emotion, emotion to the grain. And then that's the final shot that you saw on the trailer. Yeah? Should we move on to the next one? Excellent. So now let's get on with this. So don't forget the other shot that you've missed. You can find it on Hugo's desk in a couple of weeks, months or years, maybe. So yes, and now you really have to vote this correctly. And let's not force myself to have to count. Let's get on with this. So would you guys like to see a shot from Dawn of the Titans, which is a full CG shot? similar to the one you just saw, or would you like to see a highly stylized shot from The Walking Dead March to War? So, Dawn of the Titans. Okay, I know where this is going. Walking Dead March to War. Yeah, look at that. You guys are... So while I'm opening the shot, I will allow you guys to have one question. Anyone has a question about what they just saw? We'll have questions at the end, but you're the, f you're the, the guy that will have the question then. Come on, go for it. Um, how do you make sure you when you have fake depth uh, motion blur and yeah. you're putting depth of field on top so you don't have any artifacts or anything like that? Do you uh, apply the motion blur to your depth pass as well? Or? I do, and it 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 has results uh, that could go from horrible to good. It depends on the day, I guess. Sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I can't have baked motion blur. For such a fast trailer, it doesn't really matter because the shots are so quick that you can kind of tweak any kind of uh, uh, inaccuracies with the motion blur with a bit of paint tool, with like a roto paint. Uh, but if it's like a slow shot, you might want to consider baking either the depth of field um, in the, um, the depth of field in the read 3D or do the motion blur in Nuke. It really depends from shot to shot. Yeah? One, one other question that I'll allow. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, what do you think is the best way to add motion blur besides back to curve blur? In Nuke, there is no other way to add motion blur in Nuke besides the vector blur. But you can buy the motion blur plugins that are, there's a couple of companies that sell motion blur plugins, but eh, they're not very good. So I would stick with vector blur or to actually bake it. If you can, you should bake motion blur because it gives you better results. I don't tend to, to uh, bake depth of field because I don't like the results on depth of field baked. 
Because when you bake the Aptive Field in CG, you don't control the bouquet, you don't control the nice stones of f-stops, it's not as easy, and you get a lot of noise on it as well. So I prefer to do the Aptive Field in 2D and Motion Blur in 3D. And again, I sometimes have bad results, sometimes I have good results. Now, going back, questions are over. This shot is even more, this shot is much more simple. So it all started, uh, back in the day, in 1978, when I was born, no. The thing is, Walking Dead was a trailer which was highly stylized. It all started by the wonderful work done by our concept artist, uh, Robin, what's his last name? I can't remember. Robin, sorry, I can't remember your last name. But Robin, which is amazing, did this matte painting in Photoshop. This matte painting has a peripheral of layers, as you can see here, that was all built in Photoshop, and we got this matte painting approved. The whole point of this, if you went to my talk before, or if you watch it later on, is that the client wanted to look as close as we could to the comic book. That was the brief, really. So we picked this up, both me and Bjorn and a few other people, picked this matte painting up, and first of all, uh, reformat it to something more digestible, because it was 6K coming from Photoshop, and we started using a 3D system. Now, I'm going to go first back to the, to the whole bottom here just to show you how it looks at the very end. Um, because in 3D, you can kind of see what I'm doing here. So this is a really simple shot. I basically just have a background, a bit of a, of a, of a background here with, uh, with the hills. Then I have some, some um, sorry, so then I have the bridges here. And I basically have the actual filters that get a lot of noise on it. So as you can see, very simple CG, very simple shot, but very effective. A lot of times simplicity is the way to go. And this is how the shot looks at the very end. So it's a highly stylized shot that the whole idea was that it would look as close to the comic book as possible. It has a flare as well. It has to have a flare. I'm not saying everything should have a flare, but it just looks better with a flare, doesn't it? Gotta have a flare. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna have merchandise soon, and I'm gonna have a t-shirt <laughs> that says, you just have to put a flare on it. Um, so basically this shot here, I'm going to go now back to the beginning, all the way to the beginning here. The way we did was we had it all layered up in Photoshop. We then started layering it up. Like basically this is the sky background and this is my background color and that of course gets merged together. A little bit of color correction and, and basically we moved on and that was integrated, integrated into the 3D system. By this time, I wouldn't have done a scan line. I, again, I'm a big fan of the, the Ray Tracer, yes. Big fan of the Ray Tracer because it had much better quality. Even bigger fan of Octane in Nuke. You should definitely look into Octane in Nuke. It's really fast to render and it produces so much better results than the scan line or the Ray Tracer in Nuke. So basically then we go in and then split up the hills. So this is the background hills that get pre-multiplied. We then have the other hill on the very back, which we pre-multiply from Photoshop. Um, uh, of course, I could have also uh, opened up the Photoshop layer because you know, you guys know probably that in Nuke, you can literally just go in here and do breakout layers. And that will try to build the Photoshop file. A lot of times it doesn't work. Uh, you have to kind of deal with it in a special way. So for example, in here, you can see that the, res the original was this, and this is the result of the rebuild. As you can see, certain things didn't really work out. And this is because that in Photoshop, you have to be careful to rasterize images. You need to rasterize the filters. Certain filters are not supported. Uh, vectors are not supported. So you kind of have to do a new matte painting with that in mind. You basically do your matte painting, then you do a version of it with a bit uh, less uh, stuff on it so that it actually works. But going back to this, then the hills, of course, went into the 3D system. A um, bit, of, bit of color correction, uh, and then that got merged to the sky. So that's like just a simple A over B. Then basically we went in here and we had some foreground bridges. We had the bridge on the very back. Uh, we had the bridge on the street lamps. We had the other bridge on the middle. And then we had another bridge uh, on the bottom there. They all got merged together. They all got put into the 3D system. And basically, voila, we got a bridge on the middle ground of the shot. Then from there, we also have our little dude here. So this guy was actually rendered in Maya with Redshift. And this was captured using a software called IPSoft. I'm so bad at plugging softwares here right now. But anyway, what it happens is that you can use a connect 
to capture the movement, and that's what we did. This is our lovely C uh, uh, lead CG of this project, pretending to be a zombie being captured by a connect. And then basically we render this uh, with all the object IDs and all the passes that we tend to, to have. Uh, okay, 10 minutes they say. Um, and so then basically we have the shadows as well. That all goes into a 3D system as well. And it's placed on that bridge that you saw on the top. Actually, there's no bridge yet because he's behind the bridge. So once he is there, we then put in the bridge. We have the road, which basically has the front row. We have the middle roads, the other, all the bridges here. I'm going to just show you because I want to show you the other shot. So this is the full bridge setup that we have goes into the 3D system again, and kind of looks like that, and then it gets merged with a bit of a light wrap, and as you can see, this is how it looks so far. It's a really simple comp, but effective, really. Uh, then, last but not least, we have some foreground. The foreground is literally a couple of more bridges on the foreground, which are placed into a Project 3D with a card which is slightly bended. That goes into the uh, scanline render, it gets rendered, uh, we have a bit of an erode because we were fixing some edges, some problems with edges in Photoshop that we had here. We light wrapped it and basically we had this shot before and then we have a bit of light wrapping uh, on the bridge and then it goes in here, uh, there. And then last but not least, we have some textures of noise. That also goes into the 3D system, gets merged on top. So we get this greedy feeling of the comic book. Then I finally have a couple of uh, weighted blur here, which is from my friend Toby Lindback. He taught me this before, so I use it all the time. It basically just gives you a really nice diffuse emotion into the image. Uh, some shots you see it more than others. Then we have, of course, a couple of more glows uh, to kind of simulate the sunset with some, basically so that you can kind of feel that it's like some sunny day on the back. And this is done by the glow with a color corrector and then merged on top. And then, of course, a flare. This flare was rendered with optical flares uh, inside of Nuke. Uh, big fan of optical flares. Uh, gets merged on top. I rendered it separately because optical flares currently renders, does not render on Nuke 11 or 10. It crashes all the time, so I have to use Nuke 9 to render it out. Um, basically, then I do some final color corrections, a bit of a vignetting, another bit of vignetting, some sharpen, some chromatic aberration, some lens distortion to a 50 mil, some real grain, some more grain, because why not? And then the final shot is like this. All good? So let's, I have like five minutes probably. Um, so I'm gonna just go and move on to the next one. So like I said, the other shot I didn't show, you guys can go to my channel. At some point I will disconstruct that shot. And now let's, Keep on going with this voting. Your voting counts. So, what do you guys want to see? You guys want to see the lovely Heroes Arena with all that drops of, of, of rain on her face and depth of field and everything? Or a brand new shot from a trailer that never came out yet. It's not out yet. It will be out in a few months. But I can show you one shot. In which it's for Vermintide 2 Warhammer and it's fully done in uh, uh, live action. So CG first, this one. How many hands for this one? Okay, wow. And then this one. Yeah, okay. And now we are over with the talk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, do I have five minutes? Is anyone from the foundry in the room? Oh, great. And then I have a lot of time. <laughs> so, and while I'm opening the shot, I will open the floor for a couple of questions about the shot that we just saw or any other thing, except if it's a romantic related question. I am not going to do those ones. So, any questions? No questions. Oh, okay. Here we go. You over there were first. Yeah, you were first. Yeah, go for it. Do I still have five minutes? Great. So yes, so answering you, uh, you can always try to use the ZD Focus node in Nuke. You can give it a go, I've used it for years. It's not very effective because for me, I think it's like, it's a little bit uh, non-accurate. Uh, uh, you can't put lenses, you can't put f-stops. Um, I would say that the cheapest one would be Lens Care from a company that I'm gonna butcher the name. It's called Fritschlove, isn't it, or Fritschlove? Fischluf, yeah. It's called Landscare, it's only 75 quid or something, and it produces really good depth of field, but it's really slow. So good luck with that. So 
This was uh, for Vermintide um, uh, 2. This trailer is not out yet. The reason why it's taking so long to play back is because this is a 4K uh, production, all in live action, and it's in HDR as well. So it's a little bit heavy. Uh, I can't show you the trailer because the trailer is not out. The trailer will be out later. So this is the shot. I won't play it back now because it's not going to play back probably. But basically the whole thing was done in live action. And we went to Stiller Studios, which is a, a, a motion control studio, and we shot stuff like this. I'm going to show you. So this is the raw plate from Red. We shot it on 8K to produce 4K. And we basically picked up thousands and thousands of models from Warhammer uh, and ra basically from Vermintide. Uh, from, War from Games Workshop, and we got them, and we got a bunch of professional painters to paint them by hand, and then we build all these sets. I can't wait to show you the trailer someday when it comes out. And as you can see, it was all motion control. The reason it was all motion control, it was because it could allow us to do things like this. We have, for example, here, the one with the green screen with this little bad dude here, and, and this allows you, because we have motion control, we can do, for example, a fog pass. So for example, if I go here, well, not only a fog pass, for example, a lightning pass. So at some point on the shot, we have lightning happening. So we then we can shoot the whole plate in lightning, or we can shoot the whole plate with another type of lightning. So we basically have two types of lightning on the shot. So at some point here, we, it's basically me playing like I'm doing CG for real in real life. It's great. So we have like the raw plate. This, this would be what I would say the diffuse pass. And this would be like a, a fancy speckler pass and another fancy speckler pass. And then I can just animate this and get some nice lightning, you know. And not even better than that is I can actually have some nice fog. Where's the fog? Where's the fog, Bjorn? You know where the fog is? Uh, God damn it, these comps are so big. It's all your fault. They're so big. I'm joking with you. Bjorn comp this with me and he was amazing at it as always. So this is the fog pass which we almost died on set to do. But as you can see the same thing because we have motion control we can then fill up the whole set with uh, smoke and actually produce a fog pass. Now I'm gonna really quickly otherwise, otherwise they're gonna kick me out. Um, so just gonna run down through the script really quickly to show you how, how this was built. So we basically have a matte painting on the background, which is run through the camera in CG. Remember, it's motion control, so the camera, of course, we got the camera. Um, I'll wait for a second for that to load up. I think I actually have a pre-comp here. So that's the sky that we did, the matte painted, talented David Gibbons did that matte painting. Then from there on, we had some uh, back mountains as well that we used as well. That got in there, so basically we got the back mountains with the other mountains as well. Um, then we had a bunch of rats on the back because, of course, a thousand rats is not enough. We want two thousand rats. And so the way that this was made is we have a pre-comp here. By the way, my, my, my pipeline also allows you to open pre-comps that were pre-rendered before. While that's opening on the background, I'm going to move on with this. So basically, this was basically comping all those rats with some fires. Now, the fires were rendered on basically individual 2D elements of fire that were tracked in individually into the rats. And then basically we color corrected them to look like they are actually uh, lit by those fires as well. So now if I jump into the other comp here, you'll see what I mean. So those rats that you saw in the background, they're made by this. So basically um, on set we photographed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rats of, uh, of models. And then we did, we did photograph, we also did photogrammetry for some of them. Uh, so we actually used photogrammetry for some of them. And, and this is a 3D system with a bunch of them. You know, we, have, we have this dude here, we have this dude here, we have this dude here, this dude here, that dude here, and you know, all these dudes. They're all nice and dudes and cool. Uh, and of course, then this gives you this. This is a, a mush of rats with some fire. That end goes into the comp, looks pretty as hell. And then we basically get the lens distortion in because, of course, we had to put distortion into the plate uh, because this is live action. And then from there, uh, we have a little trick here with additive gear that I can't tell you about anymore because I don't have time. But come to my channel and you can check it there. Um, basically, then I have the lightning pass. Remember, I animated the lightning so that you could see the feeling of lightning on the shot. Uh, basically then we merged all that stuff together 
together with the fog as well that looks pretty as hell look at that beautiful thing so nice fog another fog even more fog as well and then at the time we had some uh, temporary uh, color corrector some grain and some stuff and i'm gonna just play this back but i'm gonna put it to uh, one to two so i'm gonna have to reduce the quality because i just want to show you the lightning effect and in the meantime i'll take one question about this project one question no wow you guys hated this shot <laughs> this is incredible so you see this is what i mean you see when you animate the um, the lightning i'll just keep it running so any questions at all okay here did you get a few <laughs> i have a few yeah i have a few they gave us a bunch you know like on games games workshop they gave us like hundreds and hundreds of them um, but uh, as you can see here when it play back that's the feeling that you get the whole thing with the fog the whole thing with the lightning all the fires are 2d elements you know and it turned out really well but this is not the coolest shot this is actually probably a lame shot for that trailer but i can't show you the trailer so let's just go back to the presentation here so as you know the other shot you didn't saw will be on Hugo's desk uh, on YouTube. And don't forget to visit the BenQ uh, uh, boot tomorrow. Last demo will be done there as well. Don't forget to support me on Patreon so that you can see more lovely, um, more lovely uh, tutorials like this one. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to my Hugo's desk channel. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter on Hugo C. Guerre. And thank you so very much for watching.